Book Two, Mess Letiri. Chapter One, A Troubled Life but a Quiet Conscience. Mess Letiri, a conspicuous man in Saint Samson, was a redoubtable sailor. He had voyaged a great deal. He had been a cabin boy, seaman, topmast man, second mate, mate, pilot, and captain. He was at this period a ship owner. There was not a man to compare with him for general knowledge of the sea. He was brave in putting off to ships in distress. In foul weather, he would take his way along the beach, scanning the horizon. What have we yonder? he would say. Some craft in trouble? Whether it were an interloping Weymouth fisherman, a cutter from Aurigny, a Biscine from Courcelles, the yacht of some nobleman, an English craft or a French one, poor or rich, mattered little. He jumped into a boat, called together two or three strong fellows, or did without them, as the case may be, pushed out to sea, rose and sank, and rose again on rolling waves, plunged into the storm, and encountered the danger face to face. Then, afar off, amid the rain and lightning, and drenched with water, he was sometimes seen upright in his boat like a lion with a foaming mane. Often he would pass whole days in danger amidst the waves, the hail, and the wind, making his way to the sides of foundering vessels during the tempest, and rescuing men and merchandise. At night, after feats like these, he would return home and pass his time in knitting stockings. For fifty years he led this kind of life, from ten years of age to sixty, so long did he feel himself still young. At sixty he began to discover that he could no longer lift with one hand the great anvil at the forge of Varclin. This anvil weighed three hundred weight. At length rheumatic pains compelled him to be a prisoner. He was forced to give up his old struggle with the sea, to pass from the heroic into the patriarchal stage, to sink into the condition of a harmless, worthy old fellow. Happily, his rheumatism attacks happened at the period when he had secured a comfortable competency. These two consequences of labour are natural companions. At the moment when men become rich, how often comes paralysis, the successful crowning of a laborious life? Old and weary men say among themselves, Let us rest and enjoy life. The population of islands like Guernsey is composed of men who have passed their lives in going about their little fields or in sailing round the world. These are the two classes of the labouring people, the labourers on the land and the toilers of the sea. Mess Letiri was of the latter class. He had had a life of hard work. He had been upon the continent, was for some time a ship carpenter at Rochefort, and afterwards at Set. We have just spoken of sailing round the world. He had made the circuit of all France, getting work as a journeyman carpenter, and had been employed at the great salt works of Franche Comte. Though a humble man, he had led a life of adventure. In France he had learned to read, to think, to have a will of his own. He had had a hand in many things, and in all he had done had kept a character for probity. At bottom, however, he was simply a sailor. The water was his element. He used to say that he lived with the fish when really at home. In short, his whole existence, except two or three years, had been devoted to the ocean. Flung into the water, as he said, he had navigated the great oceans, both of the Atlantic and the Pacific, but he preferred the channel. He used to exclaim enthusiastically, That is the sea for a rough time of it! He was born at sea, and at sea would have preferred to end his days. After sailing several times round the world, and seeing most countries, he had returned to Guernsey, and never permanently left the island again. Henceforth his great voyages were to Granville and Saint-Malo. Mess Letiri was a Guernsey man, that peculiar amalgamation of Frenchman and Norman, or rather English, he had within himself this quadruple extraction, merged and almost lost in that far wider country, the ocean. Throughout his life, and wheresoever he went, he had preserved the habits of a Norman fisherman. 
All this, however, did not prevent his looking now and then into some old book, of taking pleasure in reading, in knowing the names of philosophers and poets, and in talking a little now and then in all languages. Chapter 2. A Certain Predilection Gilead was a child of nature. Mess Lethierry was the same. Lethierry's uncultivated nature, however, was not without certain refinements. He was fastidious upon the subject of women's hands. In his early years, while still a lad, passing from the stage of cabin boy to that of sailor, he had heard the Admiral de Suffren say, "'There goes a pretty girl, but what horrible great red hands!' An observation from an admiral on any subject is a command, a law, an authority far above that of an oracle. The exclamation of Admiral de Suffren had rendered Lethierry fastidious and exacting in the matter of small and white hands. His own hand, a large club fist of the colour of mahogany, was like a mallet or a pair of pincers for a friendly grasp, and, tightly closed, would almost break a paving-stone. He had never married. He had either no inclination for matrimony, or had never found a suitable match. That, perhaps, was due to his being a stickler for hands like those of a duchess. Such hands are, indeed, somewhat rare among the fishermen's daughters at Port Bale. It was whispered, however, that at Rochefort, on the Charente, he had, once upon a time, made the acquaintance of a certain grisette, realising his ideal. She was a pretty girl with graceful hands, but she was a vixen, and had also a habit of scratching. Woe betide any one who attacked her! Yet her nails, though capable at a pinch of being turned into claws, were of a cleanliness which left nothing to be desired. It was these peculiarly bewitching nails which had first enchanted and then disturbed the peace of Lethierry, who, fearing that he might one day become no longer master of his mistress, had decided not to conduct that young lady to the nuptial altar. Another time he met at Aurigny a country girl who pleased him. He thought of marriage, when one of the inhabitants of the place said to him, "'I congratulate you. You will have for your wife a good fuel-maker.' Lethierry asked the meaning of this. It appeared that the country people at Aurigny have a certain custom of collecting manure from their cow-houses, which they throw against the wall, where it is left to dry and fall to the ground. Cakes of dried manure of this kind are used for fuel, and are called coipillot. A country girl of Aurigny has no chance of getting a husband if she is not a good fuel-maker, but the young lady's especial talent only inspired disgust in Lethierry. Besides, he had in his love matters a kind of rough country folk's philosophy, a sailor-like sort of habit of mind. Always smitten, but never enslaved, he boasted of having been in his youth easily conquered by a petticoat, or rather a cotillon, for what is nowadays called a crinoline was in his time called a cotillon, a term which, in his use of it, signifies both something more and something less than a wife. These rude seafaring men of the Norman archipelago have a certain amount of shrewdness. Almost all can read and write. On Sundays, little cabin boys may be seen in those parts, seated upon a coil of ropes, reading with book in hand. From all time, these Norman sailors have had a peculiar satirical vein, and have been famous for clever sayings. It was one of these men, the bold pilot Carripel, who said to Montgomery, when he sought refuge in Jersey after the unfortunate accident in killing Henry the Second at a tournament with a blow of his lance, Tet fol a casse tet feet. Another one, Touzeau, a sea captain at saint Brelard, was the author of that philosophical pun, erroneously attributed to Camus, Après la mort, les papes deviennent en papillon, et les cires deviennent en siron. Chapter 3. The Old Sea Language The mariners of the Channel are the true ancient Gauls. The islands, which in these days become more and more English, preserved for many ages their old French character. 
The peasant in Sark speaks the language of Louis the Fourteenth. Forty years ago, the old classical nautical language was to be found in the mouths of the sailors of Jersey and Origny, when amongst them it was possible to imagine oneself carried back to the sea-life of the seventeenth century. From that speaking trumpet, which terrified Admiral Hiddy, a philologist might have learnt the ancient technicalities of manoeuvring and giving orders at sea, in the very words which were roared out to his sailors by Jean Bart. The old French maritime vocabulary is now almost entirely changed, but was still in use in Jersey in 1820. A ship that was a good plier was Bon Boulanier. One that carried a weather helm in spite of her foresails and rudder was un vaso ardent. To get under way was prendre air, to lie to in a storm at Capelle. To make fast running rigging was faire dormant, to get to windward faire chapelle, to get the cable tight faire test, to be out of trim etre en pantaine, to keep the sails full porte plein. These expressions have fallen out of use. Today we say louvoyer for to beat to windward. They said louvoyer. For naviguer, sail, they said naviguer. For virer vent devant, to tack, donner vent devant. For aller de l'avant, to make headway, tailler de l'avant. For tirer d'accord, haul together, aller d'accord. For déraper, to weigh anchor, déplanter. For embraquer, to haul tight, abraquer. For taquer, cleats, beaton. For burin, toggles, tap. For balancing, forelift, main lift, etc., valancing. For tribord, starboard, stribord. For les hommes de car à babord, men of the larboard watch, les babordis. Tourville wrote to Hockincourt, nous avons singlé, sailed, for singlé, instead of la rafale, squall, le rafale. Instead of bossoir, cathead, boussoir. Instead of dross, truss, drus. Instead of lofe, to luff, faire une olefe. Instead of elanger, to lay alongside, allanger. Instead of fort breeze, stiff breeze, servant. Instead of joual, stock of an anchor, ya. Instead of suit, storeroom, fosse. Such, at the beginning of this century, was the maritime dialect of the Channel Islands. Ango would have been startled had he heard the speech of a Jersey pilot, whilst everywhere else the sails faseyant shivered, in these islands they barbeyant. A sort de vent, sudden shift of wind, was a fol of vent. The old methods of mooring known as la valture and la portugaise were alone used, and such commands as jure chac and basse vilt might still be heard, while a sailor of Granville was already employing the word clan for sheave hold, one of Saint Aubin or of Saint Samson still stuck to his canal de Pulio, what was called Boudalange. Upper Fultuk at St. Malo was Auré d'Ain at St. Elier. Mess Lettieri, as did the Duke de Vibon, called the shear of the decks La Tonture, and the caulker's chisel La Patarasse. It was with this uncouth sea dialect in his mouth that Duquesne beat de Reuter, that Duguay Truin defeated Wasnard, and that Tourville, in 1681, poured a broadside into the first galley which bombarded Algiers. It is now a dead language. The idiom of the sea is altogether different. Dupere would not be able to understand suffering. The language of French naval signals is not less transformed. There is a long distance between the four pennants, red, white, yellow, and blue, of La Bourdonnée, and the eighteen flags of these days, which, hoisted two and two, three and three, or four and four, furnish, for distance communication, sixty-six thousand combinations, are never deficient, and, so to speak, foresee the unforeseen.' 